In our first three videos in this series, we looked at the Epicureans and Nicholas Malebranche. In both cases, we saw how important the problem of evil is. The problem of evil is a great starting point in this series because it is a classic example, a classic problem for how theology mandates a naturalistic origins. It's a theological argument for a strictly naturalistic origins theory, such as evolution. It goes way back to antiquity, so chronologically it's there at the start. And it has always been a difficult problem. It has some, something of a reputation of a very difficult problem. But it's a theological problem, and it argues for a strictly naturalistic uh, origins, at least in the hands of the Epicureans and Nicholas Malebranche. We'll see it again in this series. But that's not to say that the problem of evil is the most influential or even the most powerful argument or tradition for evolution. It isn't. There are several other arguments that are more powerful for evolution, and we're going to look at one in this video, namely the problem of distilliology. The problem of distilliology has a similar structure to the problem of evil. Remember, the problem of evil goes like this. If God was all good, all powerful, and all knowing, then there would be no evil, but evil exists. Therefore, something has to give. God must be distanced from the world. Um, some, some rationale must be given for why we have evil in the world, something like that. For some, for some reason or another, God didn't intend or create this world directly. Natural laws must have done it. Well, substitute for evil, distilliology, and you have the problem of distilliology. If God is all good, all knowing, and all powerful, then there would be no distilliology, but there's plenty of distilliology, therefore something has to give. So what exactly is distilliology anyway? Well, teleology has to do with final causes or a, a goal or a purpose or an objective. When you look at a structure, it has a reason. You can tell that. You can infer it. It looks like it was designed. It looks maybe even aesthetic. It has a symmetry. Um, it, has, it just looks like it, it was designed. You get into a brand new car. Ah, oh, it looks so nice. It feels so nice. You get a brand new computer, an Apple computer. Oh, it just looks so nice. This was obviously designed. Distilliology is the opposite. It lacks that. There's no apparent design. It just looks like it fell together randomly or something. There was no, there was no direct directed reason, no, no, no purpose, no intelligence behind it. The absence of design, that's distilliology. Now I'll get into some concrete examples so this is more clear. So don't worry if that didn't quite make sense or if you didn't quite get the gist. But before that, I want to show you an example, a historical example to help set the stage. And this comes from the Galileo Affair. This is the first half of the 1600s, first half of the 17th century. Galileo is arguing for heliocentrism, the idea that the Earth and the planets go around the sun. Copernicus had proposed that in the previous century. Galileo was arguing vigorously for that. And he accumulated some evidences for this. Some of them good, some of them not so good. The science was actually um, unclear, it was ambiguous, but he certainly had some science on his side. In the early 17th century, early in his, uh, this, this Galileo affair that spanned several decades, so early in this Galileo affair, Galileo built a telescope. He didn't invent the telescope, that's a common myth, but he did build one. He built a good, he built a good one, a bigger one, a better one, and pointed it toward the heavens. And in the fall of 1609, began looking at things. And uh, November 30th, 1609, he looked at the moon. Now, I'm sure others had looked at the moon through telescopes, but they weren't, again, they weren't as good. They weren't as powerful as Galileo's. What Galileo saw through his telescope was stunning. And if you ever get a chance, if you haven't looked through a telescope, you should look through one. It's a great experience. And if you've looked through one, you'll know what I'm talking about. The moon is a good example. It's the best, the most obvious thing you can look at in the sky, especially if you don't have a big telescope or maybe you're just looking through binoculars. But when you look at the moon, you, you really see the craters and the ridges. It's a very beautiful sight. Um, and then you see, if you look to the side, the darkness, the blackness of the infinity of space. It just goes on. You can't get that feeling looking at a picture in a book or looking at an image uh, on the internet. You have to look at the, through a telescope and see it for yourself. 
the ridges, the lighting on the moon from the sun and the ridges, especially at the shadow where the Terminator is, uh, is really stunning in itself. Or around the edges of the moon. If it's a full moon, just look around the edges and you might see some, some uh, ridges and some terrain there. It's really stunning. Now I'm going into some detail about that because this is important. This is what Galileo saw. You might take it for granted. We take it for granted today. So what? There's craters on the moon. There's rugged terrain. The topography is rugged. There are ridges. There are shadows cast by the sun. So what? What's the big deal? It was a big deal and it was powerful evidence for heliocentrism. Remember, he was arguing for heliocentrism, the idea that the Earth and the planets go around the Sun, as opposed to the Sun and the planets going around the Earth, geocentrism. This was powerful evidence for heliocentrism, right? Wait a minute. Why would that be powerful evidence for heliocentrism? The Moon has craters, therefore the Earth goes around the Sun? That doesn't make any sense. Why would that follow? Why in the 16th century would you conclude by finding out that the moon has a rugged topography that heliocentrism is true? Why would that confirm Copernicus's theory? This doesn't make any sense. Well, to understand this, you need to understand the context. Who was Galileo arguing with? What were the other positions that held sway? What was he trying to topple? What was he opposing? And that's a good lesson for origins in general, and science in general, and the history of thought in general. You need to understand the context. In this case, the most powerful opponent that Galileo was opposing was not the Bible or the church. It was Aristotelianism. For 2,000 years, Aristotelianism had reigned, and the Roman Catholic Church had incorporated it largely into their doctrines. It was very powerful, and it was a given. Uh, many people had um, started to question uh, Aristotelianism, but it was far from over at that time. And it, one of the tenets of Aristotelianism was the difference between up there and down here, the sublunar region and the superlunar region. Down here on Earth, things worked differently than up there in the sky. Uh, and up there in the sky, in the superlunar region, things were perfect. Objects were perfect. Celestial bodies were smooth, perfect. Everything was harmonious. So this gives you an idea of how important context can be in science and how important observations, which apparently otherwise seem to have nothing to do with the problem you're talking about, can be held to have great importance. It's, it all has to do with the context. Now fast forward to the latter part of the same century, the 17th century, and we're going to find another person who also opposed the craters, but for uh, the, the, the craters of the moon and the rough topography of the moon, but for a different reason. This person was not an Aristotelian. This person was an Anglican cleric by the name of Thomas Burnett. Now when I say that Burnett opposed the craters of the moon and the rough topography of the moon, I don't mean that he denied that they existed. He certainly accepted that they existed. That was a given fact by that time. What I mean is he did not believe that God would have created that topography that way. God would not have created those features. Burnett had a strong sense of aesthetics and teleology, what I talked about earlier, the sense of design. And he didn't believe that God would create these things. No designer, no creator worth his salt would have created a moon that was so ugly, uh, that lacked such uh, design aesthetics, no harmony. Now remember, the Greeks believed that these objects were perfect. The moon would have been smooth. But here we found out that it wasn't. It, it was ugly. Um, and that offended uh, Burnett's sense of aesthetics. Now, it by no means uh, was focused merely on the moon. Uh, Burnett applied this same sort of thinking to the Earth. In fact, he vacationed over in Europe. He crossed the Alps. And if you've ever gone up uh, to a, a, a mountain range, I went up to the Rockies once. I had the same experience where from afar they appear majestic. And then you get there and you go up into the mountains. And, well, the, the term cosmic junkyard kept occurring to me. There's just these moraines and, and so forth. It just seems like a cosmic junkyard. Another problem for Burnett were jagged coastlines. When you look at a map, you sometimes you see a continent 
with jagged coastlines. Think of all the fjords in Norway. That offended Burnett's sense of aesthetic. Again, he didn't like things like that. He didn't think that God would create a world like that. God would have created a smooth, perfect, harmonious world, kind of like what the Greeks were looking for in the cosmos. Um, Burnett was uh, believing in those sort, sorts of things. God would not have created this rough and rugged world. He called the, the world rude and ragged. And he said, uh, you know, the moon looks the same way. If we went to the moon and looked back at the earth, it would probably look kind of like what we see on the moon, this, this rough topography. Uh, he, he referred to the, to the earth as a world lying in its rubbish. So um, the present day earth simply was not something that God would create. So Burnett is remembered for putting together a, a powerful hypothesis, a, a popular hypothesis. It was, he wrote a book in 1681, it first appeared in 1681, The Sacred Theory of the Earth. And it was an elaborate uh, evolutionary story of how the earth, how the history of the earth unfolded and it initially was perfect and smooth and so forth. And then um, the flood came and these powerful forces acted on the earth and cracked it like an egg and created these jagged coastlines and mountain ranges and so forth. So it was naturalistic events that caused these things, not God. God wouldn't have created this this way. He made this powerful argument. Burnett is remembered as kind of a quaint example of uh, how science was, you know, changing and in the early days of science kind of went through these um, sorts of stories, these cosmogonies, stories of how the earth evolved. And it's really kind of a prototype cosmology, if you will. It really uh, was a kind of a quaint example of early science and how we, you know, it evolved to be more accurate later on. And Burnett is also remembered for how uh, both religion and science were kind of interwoven in his thought and how religion can complement science and they can kind of work together and so forth. And he did include these biblical events such as the fall and the flood in this narrative of events that created the earth, the present day earth as we know it. So he's kind of remembered for these sorts of um, ideas that he brought into the literature. But otherwise, these ideas are now considered to be somewhat passe, kind of a quaint example of something from the 17th century. Okay, in this video, we're going to discuss and I'll show you how Burnett is anything but quaint and anything but passe. He had arguments that were very powerful and very much persist today. They persisted through the centuries and are still to used today by contemporary evolutionists as powerful evidences and powerful arguments for evolution. Burnett is anything but quaint. In his day, he remember, he used these arguments for, from distilliology for the naturalistic origins of the earth, the, the rough topography, the jagged coastlines, the things he didn't like about the earth and the moon, mandated a naturalistic sequence of events to create the earth, the present day earth as we know it. We're going to see now an example. I'll show you an example from contemporary evolutionists that also uh, appeal to this distilliology. It's the exact same argument. But before I show you a contemporary example of how distilliology, the problem from distilliology, is used as powerful evidence for evolution, I want to again uh, define distilliology and can, by contrasting it with similar neighboring ideas that it is not. And it's one thing that it is not is evil. So you have evil, you have distilliology, they're not the same thing. Another neighboring idea is disutility, lack of function. Again, that's different also. These are similar ideas, but they're distinct. So evil, of course, is something that's you know, harmful or bad, usually measured in things like pain and suffering. Um, Distilly, uh, disutility is lack of function. It doesn't work or it's inefficient. And you can measure that in various ways. Distilliology is different. It's, again, this lack of design. It's more subjective. It doesn't matter if it works. It doesn't matter if it works very well. I don't care about that. It doesn't look right. It doesn't meet with my aesthetic. I don't think that God would have done something like that. He would not have intended for a design like that. It looks backwards. It looks upside down. It's jagged. It's just, it's not a good design. This is not like an Apple computer. It's not like a brand new Tesla car. 
uh, which are nice and smooth and you get in and oh this is so nice something that's not like that it's it's does not evidence that sort of teleology so I'll give you this contemporary example that is used by evolutionists today, such as Nathan Lentz and Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins wrote this book, The Blind Watchmaker, and he talks about why evolution is a fact, why it's true, and why we have these powerful evidences. And one of the evidences that he talks about is our vision system, the eye. And he talks about the way that it's just it lacks teleology, it lacks design. It would never have been intended. So I want to talk a little bit about how it works and then what, what it is that lacks teleology. I have made several other videos about this, so you can look at those other videos for more details. I'll just briefly give you an overview here so you get the point. Okay, so imagine light is coming into your eye. It first goes through a lens, and then it gets played upon the back of the eye, the retina. And in the retina, there are several different types of cells, cells that do different jobs, one of the cells is called the photoreceptor cell and that's where the light is actually detected and turned into electricity. So inside the photoreceptor cell are small organic molecules called opsins. When the light impinges on the opsin, the opsin changes its configuration. That changing of configuration of this small little organic molecule sets off an incredible cascade, a sequence of events that ultimately ends up generating an electrical signal that goes off to the brain. So there you have it, light coming into the eye, turns into electricity, electricity goes to the brain. That's the sequence, very simple. Now of course it's anything but simple. Now I want to explain a little bit about how it works. When the light enters your eye and plays upon the retina, there are two different types of photoreceptor cells, rods and cones. The rods help for low light conditions. They are cigar shaped photoreceptor cells and uh, they give you your grayscale vision and then the cones give colors. And so when the light enters your eye, if it's low light conditions, there are cells before the photoreceptor cells that help to vector the light toward the rod shape, the, the rod photoreceptor cells. Um, the mitochondria in the cone cells help to focus the light in higher light conditions. These uh, mitochondria, as you remember from your high school biology class, that's the powerhouse of the cell. The mitochondria produce the ATP adenine triphosphate molecules that provide energy and those are generated from hydrocarbons in a very complicated process so hydrocarbons are taken and broken down and you generate ATPs very complicated process in the mitochondria well the mitochondria also do something else in the cone the photoreceptor cone cells they help to focus the light onto the appropriate opsins so you have some very tricky optical tricks being played both by other cells outside of the photoreceptor cells that help to vector the light. They're waveguides, they're optical waveguides guiding the light to the right place. And then the mitochondria within the cells doing tricks as well, focusing the light. So it's some incredible optical tricks being played to enhance, and these greatly enhance by many factors. Uh, greatly enhance our vision. And we find tricks like this in other species as well to do fantastic things with our vision. Chickens have some incredible optical tricks in their vision. Now, when this is all done, the um, when you do finally get the light sensed at the opsin, as I mentioned, it gets converted ultimately to an electrical signal sent off to the brain. So you have electrical signals coming from your vision system into the brain. Now this is also true for your other sensors, your, your touch, your taste, your, your, your hearing, things like that. Are they all reporting electrical signals to the brain? So picture the brain with these, um, these bundles, these bundles of neurons coming into the brain with electrical signals. Now I don't know about you, but the electrical signals don't do much for me. How, how can you, if, if, if you, if you were to, um, look at the, the bundles in my brain, going, going into my brain, you'd see just electrical signals, voltages, changing voltages. That doesn't do much for me. How am I going to see? How am I going to hear? How am I going to touch? 
how do I have this conscious sensory perception experience? How do you have this? How do we have this? It's kind of like a movie we're living in. We're, we're experiencing the sights and the sounds. Somehow these electrical signals are converted into a conscious sensory perception. Now I've done other videos on this problem, this conscious sensory perception problem. I call it a problem simply because from a scientific perspective, we have no explanation for how these electrical signals are converted into a conscious sensory perception. There's no uh, scientific explanation, no natural law, no naturalistic process to explain this. And this problem has been known for a long, long time. In fact, it goes back to the 17th century and Burnett and even before Burnett. So we've known about this problem of, gee, how do we have this con conscious sensory perception, this conscious experience? Consciousness, how do we have it? How does it arise um, from natural law, natural processes? And with all of the work we've done, all the experiments, all the brain surgeries, um, all of our research, we still have are no better off in explaining this problem. You take that problem along with the other um, designs that I just mentioned earlier, the, the, sh the wave guides and the focusing of the light, the retina, the photoreceptor cells, the opsins, the generating of an electrical signal. All of this is incredibly complex. Uh, I haven't even touched, scratched the surface really in this video. You can go look at my other videos um, and look at other resources. It's an incredible technology. It, is is beyond explanation for the theory of, of evolution. In fact, it falsifies evolution. For example, today's science, according to today's science, there is no evolutionary explanation for how the conscious sensory perception could have, would have evolved by random mutations and natural selection. There's just no explanation for how that could have happened. Um, evolution needs naturalistic processes, natural laws, um, for in order for natural selection to work. There's nothing there for natural selection to work on. So it doesn't work. The science is contradicting the theory. But none of this matters to evolutionists because they're convinced evolution is right, for example, because of the problem of dysteleology. And in fact, here we have an example of dysteleology on the vision system itself. What do I mean? Well, if you look at a cephalopod, such as a squid, their vision system is remarkably like ours. In fact, it's another problem for evolution. You have a very similar vision system in very distant species. It's an example of what they call convergence. Again, I've talked about this in my other videos. You can look at those. But in there is one difference. If you look at the vision system of a squid, for example, okay, the light comes in, like I mentioned, goes through a lens, impinges upon the opsin in the photoreceptor cell, and then the electricity comes out the other end toward the brain and goes to the brain. Makes sense, right? In our vision system for humans and mammals, the photoreceptor cells are flipped. So the opsins are now at the back end. So the light is coming through. It has to pass through a lot of material, including a good part of the photoreceptor cell itself to get to the opsin in order to trigger that cascade I talked about. Then that electrical signal that I talked about is generated, and it's going forward now. It's going back toward the light, the origin of the light. It's going the wrong way. It's not going toward the brain like it did in the squid. Do you see what's going to happen here? It's backwards. It offends evolutionists' sense of design, like those ridges, those craters, those uh, jagged coastlines, and so forth, offended Burnett's sense of design. These photoreceptor cells offend the evolutionist's sense of design. God would never have done it that way. No creator worth his salt would have done it that way. This obviously must have evolved. I don't care about all these problems. I don't care about sensory perception, the conversion of light to electricity, all the fancy mechanisms and the optical tricks. It must have evolved somehow because evolution must be true. It must be true because the religion mandates it. So one good example of this, as I mentioned a minute ago, comes from Richard Dawkins and his book, The Blind Watchmaker. He goes through an explanation of this biology and how these photoreceptor cells are wired in backwards. He writes here, each photocell is in effect wired in backwards. 
and he goes through an explanation of what I explained to you a minute ago. But then he explains how, well, actually, it's probably okay. Uh, either he realized or a reviewer pointed out to him that actually there is no problem with this, and in fact, it works a whole lot better. So he says here, uh, uh, well, presumably suffering at least some attenuation and distortion, and then he has a parenthetical, actually probably not much, but still, it's the principle of the thing that would offend any tidy-minded engineer. You see, he doesn't care if it works. Function is not uh, at, at, at play here. It doesn't matter if it works. It doesn't matter how well it works. That's not the point. It's not designed. It could not have been designed. It's not an example of teleology. It's an example of distileology. It must have evolved. Evolution must be true. So this is the fourth video in this sequence showing the history of theological arguments that powerfully argue for and powerfully mandate a strictly naturalistic origins, an evolutionary theory of origins. In this video, we're looking at the problem of distilleology and why that mandates an evolutionary theory and how it was can be traced back to the Anglican cleric Thomas Burnett in the mid-late 17th century and how he used it for a naturalistic origin of the earth itself. In later centuries, it was used in biology as well. Later in this sequence, in our next coming videos, we'll look at other powerful theological arguments for why evolution is true. Religion drives science and it matters.